Namaste and welcome to this talk of uh, the Jaipur Dialogues and today we have got uh, Ruchir Sharma with us after a very long time. Welcome Ruchir. Welcome to the uh, Jaipur Dialogues. Namaste everyone. Uh, thank you Sanjayji for inviting me again. Well, one short question to begin with. Has the West lost use for Pakistan? Very simple but heavy question. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yes and no, in in two ways. In terms of short-term use and utility, uh, because there's no, officially, there's no Americans left in, uh, in Afghanistan, uh, no NATO troops and uh, advisors left in Afghanistan, they don't need Pakistan in the same way that they've needed in the past 20 years since the war on terror, since uh, the September 11 attacks, when Pakistan became their indispensable ally against Al-Qaeda, against the Taliban, uh, against all the uh, factions that it turned out Pakistan was supporting with the other hand. <laughs> so that utility has expired. However, in the long-term uh, understanding of what the purpose of Pakistan is, uh, they are still very happy that such a country exists that uh, cuts India off from potential allies like Iran or uh, Russia and uh, Central Asia and uh, acts as this buffer state which uh, can be more easily controlled and manipulated than a democratic India, because it's uh, a very simple authoritarian state. You put in your order or your request or your demand, and uh, the army and ISI deliver it, maybe not to your expectations, but they deliver something for themselves and deliver something for you. And uh, the West has always chosen to turn a blind eye to the byproducts of their support for such a country. Oh, OK. Uh, uh, that's a very simple explanation of what you termed as a heavy question. Uh, but if you look at the situation that Pakistan is in and the way the IMF is uh, refusing to hold its hand, it does look that uh, a, an economic collapse is imminent. So how would the West benefit in the long run if the whole edifice collapses. Yes, so for them, they've always been told by their Pakistani partners that Pakistan is too important to be allowed to fail. Uh, it's called negotiating with a gun to, to their head that oh, we are capable of anything, we're a nuclear power, and it's your duty to make sure that Pakistan is quote unquote stable, meaning the army is in charge. Uh, because if the army is not in charge, then we have no guarantee what our people are capable of. Uh, they like to uh, tell their Western partners that the army is the only reliable institution that they can trust. Uh, civilian rulers can't because they have uh, constituents and uh, expectations of uh, delivering on certain aspirations, be it Nawaz Sharif or the Bhuttos. Uh, and uh, the people themselves have been radicalized for the 75 years of existence of this country and are much more aggressive in their ambitions for their country in terms of Islamization, in terms of its relations with the West, its relations with India, than even the army is. So they've consistently tried to uh, get help, be bailed out of situations of their own doing with this simple tactic saying that uh, you know, we might be unsavory, but the alternative is so much worse that you have no choice but to support us. Now, it seems that because of the diminished utility of Pakistan, because uh, NATO countries are no longer present in Afghanistan, uh, they ran away with their tails between their legs. Now, the West can afford to play hardball so they can extend this uncertainty and this misery for as long as they can to extract concessions uh, from, from Pakistan. Uh, as we already saw, 
Uh, the U.S. was very unhappy with uh, Imran Khan, uh, especially uh, especially because on the day of uh, the launch of the special military mission in Ukraine, Imran Khan went on uh, an official visit to Russia and uh, <laughs> caused quite some alarm among Pakistan's Western partners. And so he has been de deposed uh, with many... Uh, accusations from the public and intellectuals in Pakistan of that having been a Western-led regime change. And uh, now a new ruling dispensation has been brought forward, which in theory is supposed to be a bit more pro-Western, but that hasn't translated into any significant financial support. And uh, it might still happen, but I think... Uh, the West, uh, particularly the US and UK, are trying to extend the period of agony, of economic uncertainty for as long as they can to extract as much as they can in terms of utility from this new ruling uh, elite. Okay, uh, but it does look like that they are not able to uh, salvage much. And especially because uh, along with the economic situation there is also the security situation which is worsening and that is also much of west's own doing in the sense that they left some i don't know somebody says 85 billion dollar worth of weaponry and some say that's eight to ten billion dollars uh, of weaponry but even if it is eight to ten billion dollars it's a hell of a lot mm -hmm. which i think pakistan doesn't have that uh, much of weaponry to match and uh, earlier, the thought was that much of it would get smuggled to Pakistan, but apparently that has not happened. And the Afghans are uh, using it to their own advantage. So uh, how do you see these uh, the, uh, the two things getting juxtaposed, the security situation and the economic situation? Does it limit the capacity of the West to bail out Pakistan? That's a very good juxtaposition, very uh, important point that you mentioned there, because uh, one thing I would add to that is that while all this, uh, uh, all these munitions, all this weaponry was left behind by NATO forces in Afghanistan and are now showing up in, in Jammu and Kashmir in the hands of, uh, of terrorists, are now showing up uh, in uh, anti-government non-state actors in Pakistan. Uh, at the same time, since Imran Khan was deposed, the new uh, regime in Pakistan has been arm twisted into sending its uh, supplies of NATO grade ammunition and uh, artillery shells to Ukraine. So for the past yes. months, uh, the British Royal Air Force has been doing sorties from uh, Rawalpindi to their base in, uh, well, they have two bases in Cyprus, uh, which are sovereign British territories. They didn't give up when uh, they gave up, uh, well, they left Cyprus as a colony, but held on to two military bases there. They didn't hand that over to the Republic of Cyprus. They send it there and then uh, fly it to the border between Romania and Ukraine or Poland and Ukraine, and then it's sent to, to the front. So as a result, a lot of the stockpiles that were earlier used to, uh, to feed NATO forces in Afghanistan from uh, the Pakistani army and ordnance factories have been depleted. At the same time, you now have the Pakistani Taliban, you now have uh, uh, ISIS and Khorasan and these uh, new groups that are turning against, uh, against uh, Pakistan. And the country has limited options in dealing with them because uh, there's also the legacy of all these decades of radicalization that many people are sympathetic to the Pakistani Taliban, sympathetic to ISIS, and uh, they, the state can't be seen, the army can't be seen as acting too harsh to them either for fear of another backlash. So then in terms of uh, yeah, military and security options, the, the country does find itself in a very peculiar predicament. And then if you juxtapose that with the economic crisis that they're facing massive inflation, that there's food shortages and uh, uh, constantly uh, you see uh, 
after Javed Akhtar recently went to, to Lahore, the groundswell, the popular perception is, oh, look at these Lahori elites, you know, they're going to Mushairas and, uh, and getting lectured to by the, these, uh, these Hindustanis, uh, while uh, Atta has become 450 Pakistani rupees per kilo. And, uh, and you can see that, that uh, uh, there's even videos now uh, on YouTube uh, of people going to, to Karachi and saying, I went to the cheapest city in the world where one pound is equal to 400 Pakistani rupees and I lived off one pound over there. So that's, even people making the most of this uh, uh, YouTube stars and, and the like. So uh, there's, yeah, that's fueling resentment uh, and they need to, uh, they need to, understand that an already delicate security situation and an already del delicate political situation can be made much worse through inflation, through these shortages. Uh, people tend to forget that the Arab Spring started off because of the price of bread and tomatoes in North Africa. It didn't start in Syria, it didn't start in Lebanon, it didn't even start in Egypt, even though these became the, the big uh, famous ones. It started because of the uh, price of bread and uh, and the subsidies for food for basic food stuffs uh, food stuff had been cut down through government austerity, and that was really part of the social contract there. That uh, for decades the people had learned not to rebel against authority because then at least the government feeds us, at least we can get bread and milk for our children, and when that stops, then the entire relationship between the public and the state collapses i think if i'm right it started in, with tunisia yes and uh, the, the arab spring almost everywhere had one fallout that is the radicals took over yes exactly that when the old guard uh, often some sort of strong man authoritarian who acted like the father of the nation or military rule when that's deposed from public rage, then the extremists are, uh, find it the easiest to, to make hay while the sun is shining. And uh, the Arab Spring, what started off as economic rage was channeled into... Islam to uh to restore the old order as we've seen successfully in egypt and less successfully in syria where it led to a civil war uh, yes uh, but then uh, if it happens in pakistan there's also the added problem of having jihadis of uh, uh, different hues you know the different colors of the spectrum different bands there so on the one hand, there is the Barelvi TLP, which has in fact had issued an ultimatum of 72 hours to bring down the petrol and diesel prices. Otherwise, they would do what they they threatened that they do best is to uh, do street marches and they do long marches and all that. And on the other hand, the people who are in TTP and those who are threatening Islamabad from the West, they belong to the Dev Bandi denomination, and both of them have no love lost for each other. So how how will how will it uh, pan out? <laughs> well, it's hard to say how it will pan out apart from uh, it contributing to. A a much more uncertain situation that unlike the others uh, where it's uh, the unlike let's say Egypt where it's the army versus the Muslim Brotherhood this is more like uh, Syria where it's the old guard against two or three different hues of alternative power centers who all try to create their own political philosophy and marry that to the religion or marry that to ethnic uh, and feudal relationships and if you if you look at at pakistan its army has traditionally been dominated by uh, by punjabis pakistani punjabis west punjabis 
and sees an underrepresentation of people from Sindh or Baluchistan or Khyber Pakhtunwa. And that makes it very easy to mobilize people on regional, on tribal, on feudal, and clan uh, bases, uh, bases, uh, bases, in addition to this religious uh, rift. Now, then it comes down to what is one's desired outcome as a third party to this uh, uh, potential conflict. So this is where they get to negotiate with their gun to the head saying, look, we're in danger that this might happen. You know, these extremists might come to power or these separatists might come to power. And uh, we have the Islamic bomb and we're supposedly responsible. They claim to be responsible uh, despite having uh, shared their nuclear technology with uh, North Korea. Uh, in the last 20 years, where they claim that they're, they're more responsible with their weapons than these religious extremists or these separatists. You can't allow the uh, Pakistani nuclear deterrent to fall into the wrong hands because they might actually use it in a, <laughs> let's say, non-deterrent way. Not that uh, the ISI and Pakistani army have a no-first-use policy. I fully expect them to use it first in any future uh, hot conflict. But this is what they'll say to negotiate. <laughs> okay, yeah, they are experts at negotiating. They can negotiate their way out from the deepest of morasses. Uh, I'm actually a, a little intrigued by the China response. China seems to be behaving as if the Iron Brother doesn't exist for them. Yeah, that, that's also quite amusing because uh, they they have constantly said that oh, China and Pakistan are iron brothers in the in the 70s when the US uh, didn't have diplomatic relations with uh, with China it was Nixon and Kissinger who used Pakistan as their gateway to reestablish relations uh, their relationship with China and create this uh, this uh, alliance uh, sorry economic between the US and China which uh, initially was one of dependency, uh, now still is, but reversed. So now it's the US that has outsourced all its manufacturing to China uh, and is dependent on them. And China also holds a lot of US debt, but also military that uh, this unholy alliance of the US, China and Pakistan was quite detrimental to, to Indian interests and to Soviet interests, because these are the two historical rivals, the People's Republic of China, uh, became quite hostile to the USSR from the 60s, 70s onwards, and India and Pakistan were traditional rivals. And so now the two blocks solidified. And uh, even a few years ago, there were statements from, uh, from Beijing uh, where they said, uh, Pakistan is our Israel, uh, that the same relationship that the US has with Israel is what uh, China sees its relationship with Pakistan as being. Uh, that this is their garrison state, uh, heavily militarized, that can do a lot of things that the superpower itself can't get away with being seen to do openly. So you get your attack dog to do it. Now, in that light, it is surprising at first when you think that China hasn't done much to alleviate the uh, economic and security uh, concerns uh, of the current Pakistan and new regime. And there's a couple of reasons for that. First of all, their uh, preferred uh, ruler that was Imran Khan uh, is no longer in power. Uh, he was deposed at a very sensitive time, just as uh, uh, China was very firmly backing uh, uh, the Russian position on the conflict in Ukraine. Uh, to have then lost one of their prime assets to a more Western-oriented uh, uh, ruling clique uh, was a blow to them. And in addition, China had invested heavily in the past few years in Pakistani infrastructure and economic development, but with very little return on that investment, with very little to show for it. And it didn't even get them much goodwill from the public. And now we've seen instances of uh, of Chinese uh, uh, workers and companies being attacked uh, by uh, by mobs or by uh, uh, by ordinary Pakistanis, 
So they might not see much to be gained in further investment, but rather uh, re-establishing a dependent relationship that uh, that uh, perhaps more, uh, let's say, uh, loans rather than aid would be the way forward so that they can also get some leverage on the government and push or arm twist for policies that they desire. But because at the moment, they lost a couple of cards that they used to play. Uh, do you also see this uh, uh, very, very close realignment of China and Russia? Happening, of course, because of the NATO overreach. Uh, do you see that this could also result in some kind of a thaw or some kind of a meaningful thaw? Because otherwise, there can always be deception. Some kind of a meaningful thaw in the relation of uh, China and India. That would be an excellent opportunity to undo a lot of the damage that has been done in uh, Sino-Indian relations in the past few years, that uh, the Indian side has consistently shown a willingness to engage with, with Beijing uh, and has been quite conciliatory despite very uh, harsh provocations. These border skirmishes for a long time, uh, maps uh, coming out, uh, challenging not only Indian but also uh, Nepali uh, sovereignty and uh, and borders, uh, and of course the covert and overt support for for Pakistan uh, at the uh, UN with intelligence sharing and with uh, uh, with military and economic aid in the past. So it has damaged a lot of the uh, the attempts at diplomacy that uh, that India has been trying to look east for a long time. Uh, and has had success with countries in Southeast Asia, uh, with uh, with Vietnam or with Thailand or with Indonesia, but uh, and also with our traditional partners uh, in Japan and East Asia. But uh, under Xi Jinping, uh, it has been a tough nut to crack to create an atmosphere of constructive diplomacy between New Delhi and uh, and Beijing. So this is a golden opportunity that as the, the world is entrenching itself into two blocks, uh, NATO and Ukraine on one side and uh, Russia and China on the other, so far countries like India and South Africa have maintained neutrality. They've uh, said sympathetic things that they feel bad for the humanitarian uh, uh, situation, that peace is the only way, dialogue is constructive. Uh, not that this has been appreciated. That just means <laughs> the NATO uh, side just sees us as, uh, oh, they're doing the same old thing as the old Nam days. They pretend to be neutral, but uh, their neutrality means they're taking the side of, uh, of Russia and, uh, and its allies. Now, at the same time, we have been continuing to take part in the quadrilateral dialogue. Uh, with Japan, Australia, and the US, which is very much an anti-China uh, maritime and increasingly, uh, let's say, uh, terrestrial uh, gr uh, group. It's not an alliance, but maybe an alignment. Uh, not that we've really pushed anything through it, because I think that Indian diplomats are still uh, keen to not bring up sensitive topics. So if you look at the Quad, it's always talking about the concerns of Japan and Australia. It never releases statements about uh, Aksai Chin or uh, Tibetan sovereignty or the uh, skirmishes on the border to avoid uh, any negative perceptions in, in Beijing. Now, I think the willingness is there on the Indian side to have a reconciliation with China and uh, be able to once again flex a bit of muscle domestically because since the, the border clashes, India has gone into an intelligence sharing agreement with the US. And because of that, we find ourselves in a dependent and inferior position in our relationship to the US where they know that we don't have an alternative 
that we can't uh, we can't be cut off from this intelligence sharing because then we're at the mercy of the People's Liberation Army uh, on our Indo-Tibetan border. And that has given the, the Democrats, has given Joe Biden and his officials a lot of audacity and, uh, and courage to interfere in India's internal affairs. And, and not just the US, even their you know, irrelevant vassal states like Canada uh, treat India as, as their colony that they act as if they have a veto over the laws passed by Indian parliament, over the uh, judgment, judgments passed by Indian courts. And there's very little pushback because we find ourselves between two hostile superpowers, neither of whom are willing to budge. And we've been pushed into a corner that we were we were doing fine with China earlier, and these skirmishes then pushed us into the arms of the US against the will, I think, of the, the public and many diplomats. And now we find ourselves unable to get out of this embrace. And they're using this embrace to push a lot of uh, instability domestically in the country. So do you think, I mean, uh, uh, two things. OK, let me uh, talk about the. Uh, global issue first, the geopolitical issue first. Recently, we found that uh, China issued a paper. It's called U.S. Hegemony and Its Perils. Have you seen it? Mm -hmm. No, I haven't. So it's uh, actually it's a fairly detailed paper which lists five hegemonies of the U.S. and how U.S. has been controlling the world, political hegemony, military hegemony, economic hegemony, specifically to the looting through the dollar, using the dollar. And in fact, in this, they have said, I also did a show on this, that they print currency using 17 cents as the cost and a $100 bill. And towards that $100 bills, we have to supply them $100 worth of goods and services. Then technological hegemony, cultural hegemony. So if there is going to be a decoupling of China and uh, the United States, uh, do you think that China can still keep pushing India the way it has been? Doesn't it sound sensible to them that if they have to take on the US in this way, the way they release this paper, then... Uh, India, uh, as a fairly powerful country, would be more useful to them against the US rather than pushing India into the arms of the US. But you never know in geopolitics, they do strange things like the US has been unnecessarily pushing Russia into the arms of China, where it, it, it makes more sense, like Trump has been saying. And I, he was doing also, but then he was prevented from doing the, the reset with the Russians. No, definitely. I think it, uh, in, in theory, it makes sense that, that China and India cooperate. Uh, they, they don't need to be allies, but at least have a non-antagonistic relationship as two major continental Eurasian powers. Uh, and of course, the sensible thing, just like you said, that the sensible relationship for Russia to have is to be uh, a part of, uh, of the West Eurasian or European uh, commercial sphere, military sphere. Uh, if, uh, if NATO you know, had to be expanded to the East, it should have included Russia. Or yes, the they, they old did Warsaw Pact should have been... Re yeah. They, they did try that. They, they, they said that, okay, we want to become part of NATO, but they were refused because they wanted to keep the the biblical Satan alive, I think. For yes, their own, exactly. People, yes, people for forget that. Uh, use. Exactly. That uh, the, the US didn't want to let Russia into NATO, even when uh, in the initial years of Vladimir Putin's rule, he was a pro Western leader and wanted good relations with the West, wanted to trade more with the European Union. Uh, wanted to reconcile with the U.S., but the, the U.S. needs an enemy 
to justify its military industrial complex. Uh, for a while after September 11, they found that enemy, but uh, that was also fleeting because uh, it wasn't as, as dominating on their culture as 40 years of Cold War rivalry with the USSR. And that still informs policymakers today. They're all old Cold Warriors or people who, when they were in their formative years, learned all their theories of geopolitics, all their theories of, uh, of great powers and hegemony based on the superpower rivalry with the USSR. So they can't shake off their historical enmity with Russia and need Russia to be uh, this cartoonish <laughs> antagonist so that they can portray themselves as the just moral uh, defenders of the uh, so-called uh, rules-based uh, international order. And with, uh, with China, it's, yeah, it's a very good point that you brought up that in theory, the logical thing is for them to, uh, to let go of their uh, obsession with redefining and revising the Indo-Tibetan border. Uh, and reconcile with India so that we can both focus, both countries can focus on economic and sociocultural re revival and renaissance and have a, a policy of non-aggression towards each other, uh, just like the good old uh, Panchil. Panchil has been enshrined in their constitution. They, they always invoke Panchil and do it in a very different way to us, that, they, that China uses the five principles from a position of strength. It will say that we are you know, demanding this, you know, we expect this because of the five principles uh, of, of foreign policy that, uh, that we set, uh, set up. Whereas when India invokes Panchil, it's used uh, in almost an apologetic way that because of Panchil, we believe in, in uh, non-intervention in others, uh, uh, in the internal affairs of other countries. But then you can also use that like China does to say that we don't tolerate the intervention of others in our internal affairs. Uh, so we can still consistently use it in a passive way. They're using it in a proactive way. We have a lot to learn from them. And it's because India acts like a, a soft state that China can see India as a punching bag, that uh, they know there's very little repercussions. Uh, yes, there's military repercussions for those individual soldiers who engage in these skirmishes at the border, but apart from banning TikTok and a couple of apps, there's no real hard power repercussion to war, uh, from India in terms of uh, responding to this sort of aggression. And this feeds into the traditional image of India that has been fed to uh, CPC and PLA officials, where they learn at the political academy and military academy that India is not a fully sovereign country and it's not a serious power because India never had a political revolution. That because we didn't take our independence by force and then after independence, we never had a revolution that got rid of the British constructed police or judiciary or even army. They claim that we're still under colonial rule. And even if, if India pretends to have an independent foreign policy, its standard operating procedures are either directly or indirectly influenced by Britain and the US. So as a result, they never see India as an equal power and don't have any reason to not act in the way they are. Of course, logically, they should cooperate with India, but they don't trust India because they see India as this, uh, this bizarre aberration in the in in the region, uh, all the other countries, uh, all the other serious countries in Asia are hard power authoritarian countries, and then you have India that's very proud to be a democracy. That amidst all this poverty and inequality, it claims to be proud of democracy instead of being proud of material prosperity, instead of being proud of political achievements. That is seen as a sign of weakness, and uh, this image of India being a dysfunctional democracy that's poor, it's unequal, it's chaotic, is used as an example in China 
as an inoculation, as a vaccination for its officials and public, saying don't demand any of this democracy nonsense. There's, there's a country that has the same size and population and geography, same levels of ethnic diversity as China. It's called India. That's a democracy. Do you want to exchange all the prosperity, all the, the material progress, the, all the hard power we've accumulated in the last 40 years, would you ever exchange that for an Indian standard of living, but with this so-called democracy? And as a result, India will not be taken seriously by the Chinese until we start acting like we know our place in the world, that we are claiming it boldly, and learn to use our hard power like they have. So China is a great country to learn from in terms of closing its, uh, its uh, uh, country to external influences, in terms of drawing red lines about how its maps and, and borders are portrayed, uh, in terms of pushing its talking points and pushing its officials in the UN system, uh, which India has not really learned to play that game. And it's not something that will only come. Some people will say, oh, just wait for India to become a $10 trillion economy or let us have a uh, per capita income of 10,000 and then we'll learn to have a spine. But if, you, if you don't have a spine at uh, $1,000 per, uh, per capita income or $3,000 per capita income, you won't magically grow one when you become a big economy. You know, then you're just a big soft economy that everyone will want to, uh, to carve up like a pie that what level of economic development was Romania, uh, so communist Romania in the 60s and 70s, when they were able to identify enemies of the state and even living abroad and ensure that they mysteriously died of radiation poisoning. So they, they had a secret weapon in Romania. It was called Comrade Radu. So Radu is a, is a popular Romanian name, but it, in this case, it was a uh, it was a code for radiation. So uh, at what level of economic development was Albania at when they were able to seed and fund political parties, fringe political parties in Western European countries that were affiliated with Albania or in Africa where there were uh, rebels in Ethiopia and Eritrea who said, oh, uh, we reject the Soviet Union, we reject uh, uh, the People's Republic of China, only Albania is the shining star of socialism that we're inspired by. <laughs> Sorry. So it, you don't have to be rich to stand up for yourself. And that's something that, uh, that we need to see, that uh, we can't wait from a middle-income country before we start flexing our muscle. If the sooner you draw your red lines and say, this for us is acceptable, this is unacceptable, the sooner people will adapt to it. Other powers will learn that there's consequences. You're quite right, because I think China drew its red lines when I think it was a $1,000 per capita economy way back in the 80s. Whereas yes. we seem to be keep waiting for becoming a $10,000 per capita economy. But then it is a habit. And we seem to be afflicted uh, so much by the Vishwaguru syndrome. Yes, uh, which I'll, is I'll give you an example. A, yeah. I'll give you an example. Yesterday, one big wig in the RSS, you know, in this uh, in the top five, he made a statement that uh, we should immediately gift some 15, 20 lakhs or at one place even said 40, 50 lakh tons of uh, wheat to Pakistan. Poor fellows, they are dying. So th that is the sort of Vishwa guru, guru image that we sometimes uh, try to inculcate. And uh, that only, uh, I think, uh, fortifies our image of being suckers. Yes, uh, th this is a complete misunderstanding of what uh, Vishwaguru should be. That uh, Vishwaguru has become like Vasudeva Kutumbakam. It's, uh, it's a joke that no one else uses it except us in this self-aggrandizing moral high ground way that, oh, because we are Vishwaguru by doing this, by doing that, I'm yet to see any other country's diplomatic service or foreign minister or head of state say, oh, thank you, India, you are Vishwaguru because you did this, because you were so generous. I don't expect uh, Erdogan uh, in Turkey to give a thank you and say, use the term Vishwaguru, that oh, because you are Vishwaguru, you 
gave us uh, uh, this aid after the uh, the earthquake. Uh, in fact, the the way I see it, a true Vishwaguru would be the lead of Vishwavidyale. That you should be setting an example, pursuing your country's material and strategic and military objectives, so that others look at you as an example. So countries in Latin America, countries in the Caribbean, in the Pacific, and in Africa, when they look for a model that we want to go from being a developing country to being a serious regional power, they look to India as the model. At the moment, the only Vishwaguru is China because they're showing how a very poor country has overcome a lot of external and internal damage to become a serious uh, power that is, has economic heft, has military heft, is uh, planning for its own period of hegemony and has a vision that in 2100, this is the role of China. It's going to be the middle kingdom again and the rest of the world will plug in to the orbit of the most important uh, historical, cultural and economic power. Now that is the true Vishwaguru. You're setting an example. You're not uh, looking for validation. You're looking to achieve your goals and you're getting rid of obstacles in, towards your goals and you're achieving them uh, as you planned. Now that is something we need to learn that Vishwaguru is not about uh, showing off your superior morality, then this is just Gandhi, Gandhianism with a new brand, new branding, because you know, Gandhi also said uh, uh, after partition that we should give uh, uh, you know, 50 lakhs uh, as reparations. 55 crores. 55 crores, sorry, uh, uh, as reparations to Pakistan because it was owed to them, despite them not honoring any of any pledges to protect their minority populations, whereas India went the extra mile of driving out the refugees who came from West Punjab, driving them out of the, uh, the monuments and public property that they had uh, uh, found shelter in. So how is this any different? Now, instead of Gandhi and morality, you call it Vishwaguru, uh, it still doesn't improve the quality of life or the security of any of our citizens, nor do we get the validation that we crave so much for. Quite right. Um, I think uh, that was very illuminating, Richard. It was very nice to have had you on the Jaipur Dialogues after a long hiatus. And uh, mm -hmm. I hope uh, you are secure and stable in Geneva so that we can have you more often on the Jaipur Dialogues. Thank yes, you very thank much you so for much. this talk. Thank you very much. Jai Hind, Vande Matra. Jai Hind, Vande Matra.